do you ever hear a noise? Not a bump in the night, but a mysterious, constant and very low frequency noise. If so, you may be one of the estimated 2% of the global population that can hear the hum. These strange noises reported by many can become that loud for your ears to pick it up as an odd ringing sound. Second, it is nauseating. And thirdly, if it is really bad, it actually feels like your brain is being squeezed. The hum is the name given to an ominous and very mysterious deeper rumbling noise that can reportedly be heard by thousands of individuals across the globe. But this very low pitched rumbling sound, kind of like a diesel engine truck indling in the distance, does not appear to be a single phenomenon. Different causes have been attributed, including local mechanical sources, often from industrial plants, as well as biological auditory effects. But no matter how hard people search, no one has been able to locate the source of the sound, and it sounds like it's coming from all directions equally. I am your host, Maria Anna van Riel, and you are listening to The Next Truth, where science and myth meet. And this week I'm speaking with ethnographic researcher and high school teacher of physics, mathematics, psychology, general science and biology, Dr. Glenn McPherson, and discuss with him what might be the source of one of the most mysterious and blood curdling noises people have heard in their lives, the hum. Dr. McPherson, welcome to the radio show of The Next Truth, where science and myth meet. For our listeners, you have lectured for 16 years at the University of British Columbia, training mathematics teachers in Faculty of Education. Today, you work with UBC uh, Robson campus with its GMAT and GRE curriculum program. Besides that, you are also an, and I hope I pronounce this one right, ethnographic researcher and high school teacher of physics, mathematics, psychology, general science and biology. Um, ethnographic research, is that not a branch of anthropology or am I incorrect? If you don't mind, I, I'd like to go back and just clarify one point. Um, yes, the information you gave about my association uh, with UBC uh, is correct, uh, except that I had uh, decided to pull back on that part of my life. And now I've gone back to my main job, which is a high school teacher. And also for the past uh, three years, I, I also teach um, R Russian language. Uh, at our our local high school. Now, with regard to um, eth ethnography and ethnographic research, yes, the uh, yes, you can argue that it's a branch of anthropology or sociology. In my case, it was in the educational context where I do my ethnographic research. Where the the basic point is to give a uh, thorough, detailed and explanatory look at other cultures and to then communicate what I've learned back to the lay person audience in a way that in, in a way that's meaningful. And this is the been the backbone of my educational research. And those skills have actually proved to be quite useful, if not foundational, for the type of work that I do in researching the world hump. So how do you end up researching the hum? This, this odd, strange, mysterious sound people have heard all over the world. What influenced you to study and research this strange noise? My own experience with it. 
in the spring of 2012, living in a small coastal community, not, not far from Vancouver in, in Canada. Later at night, perhaps 10 p.m., 10.30 p.m., I had heard what I assumed at the time were small float planes or seaplanes sea uh, flying overhead. And we do get quite a few of those in this part of the world. After a, a period of time, that explanation didn't make any sense to me. It was just happening too regularly and too often and and for too long. So then night when I was hearing this, I walked outside of my house and the noise stopped. And I was, of course, intrigued just with my background in, in as a science teacher and, and whatnot. So I searched around the house for maybe a malfunctioning piece of electrical equipment, maybe maybe a fridge motor, maybe something like that. Um, ultimately, I cut the power to the entire house and the sound got louder. This, of course, is very intriguing. And therefore, I assumed the sound was coming from one of the neighbors or somewhere in the neighborhood. And as I walked around outdoors, uh, no matter where I went, I couldn't hear the sound. I think one, one key moment for me was when I went into my car with the doors closed and the windows up and the ignition off, and then I could hear it. So that invited, of course, an experiment. So I drove around, mm. uh, even up into the mountains and even to neighboring towns and wherever the background noise was quiet enough, I could hear this. Um, I even checked uh, mining activity locally here. I did. I did cover a lot of bases. So then I was very perplexed and also very intrigued because I think like any science teacher or, or, or anyone who loves science, you love a mm -hmm. mystery. Mysteries are the, um, are, are the food of science. <laughs> yes. And so then I went to the internet and did what the majority of people do who end up discovering my project and, and my work. I typed in something like unusual low frequency humming noise, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And then all, all of a sudden I realized that what I was experiencing was widely reported. It has a historical basis and it also, and I'm something I'm sure we'll get into, it turned out the, the the good majority of the commentary surrounding it was steeped in pseudoscience, conspiracy, speculation, and in some cases, outright lunacy. So therefore, as a teacher of psychology, I checked myself and I realized, no, no, I am not experiencing a, experiencing a schizophrenic hallucination. I'm quite confident about that or some form of mass hysteria. So obviously I felt that there was a great need for a disciplined and rigorous inquiry into this phenomenon that who is hearing this? Uh, what is it? And this led me to the project as it exists now. Uh, that is the World Hum Map and that database project. Well, that's been eight, nine years now. And along the way, we've conducted a series of physical experiments, mapping, data gathering, speculation, and also some very practical work as well. And we've learned a lot in those nine years, and the work continues. You say you turned off all your electrical devices in your house, and the sound got louder. That almost sounds like as if uh, our fridge and television, computers, and et cetera, et cetera, the, the, the electrical devices are silencing this sound, this, this hum, this mysterious noise. They are masking it. And in, in fact, for the people who write to me asking for help in dealing with this, even to this day, the only really solid piece of advice that I can give them is to, in fact, turn on the, a, a fan, the bathroom fan, or to have a water feature. And that, incidentally, is why the hum is much louder at night than during the daytime. Because mm. 
daytime, human activity will create a sufficient background masking noise. And it's also for the same reason that's why the hum is louder indoors than outdoors. Well, no, no, you're saying that it is indoors is louder than outdoors. And you also mentioned just uh, uh, before, very briefly, <clears throat> when you stepped into your car and your windows were up, noise is vibration, sound is vibration, and glass, for instance, is a perfect uh, source for conducting vibrations. Uh, you, as also uh, uh, teaching physics, do you think that it is a possibility that that is the reason why it's indoors louder than outdoors, because we are surrounded, sort of less, by glass, by windows? No. And the reason why is because I, I think the evidence is now very powerful that, in fact, the world hum is not a noise. It's not a noise. It's not a noise. And just as an analogy, um, let's consider the case of, of, of a tinnitus or tinnitus, as they say in, in England and Australia. Mm -hmm. So um, that is not a noise. It's the perception of a noise that is generated by an interaction between the brain and the auditory system. You can't record it. In, in other words, if you hear a particular tinnitus frequency, let's say 5.2 kilohertz or something like that, nobody else can hear that. And therefore, I think the evidence is pretty powerful now that similarly, um, it is internally generated you say you cannot record this, but YouTube has m now millions is this accelerated, but thousands of video clips showing that uh, uh, that they have recorded a noise like trumpets or a rumbling or <clears throat> I'm sorry uh, or a noise or a sound that they cannot. Uh, well, they cannot find a source for, and it scares people like the bleep to say so. But they say that is the hum, and and they have recorded this. So if you say it cannot be recorded, and I'm playing the devil's advocate here for a brief moment, then these people have not recorded the hum at all. Correct. Then what have they recorded? Well, it's interesting that you mentioned sky trumpets. Uh, I never thought, I never thought for a moment that I would be jumping into this topic, but quite ironically, even though the, the world hum is still an open investigation, I actually solved the sky trumpets uh, a few years ago. Um, that's, oh, please, yeah. uh, enlighten me here for a sec. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah, this is, um, and what, what, what's kind of sad is how, is how simple it was uh, to solve. And in fact, in, in many of the cases, this is simply call, um, caused by larger trucks and vehicles um, uh, braking at slower speeds. And in fact, I've, 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 I've witnessed and heard the, the phenomenon myself many times, and it's been, crystal, it's been crystal clear what's causing it. And in fact, if you go onto the internet, you'll see that many, many in auto and truck mechanics have also reported the same thing. Quite, quite interestingly, um, I was in Moscow, Russia, and mm -hmm. um, I was uh, I, I was just recording a personal private travel video, and uh, I, I was. Think in I the, saw that one. Yes. Yeah. On, on your YouTube channel, I yeah. believe I saw that. Yes, and, and it was also sad is the fact that that's the most viewed video of mine on YouTube. That's also sad, but um, <laughs> and and I didn't realize until I was in an interview weeks or months later and it suddenly it dawned on me wait a minute and I, and I went back and i listened and there are the there are the sky trumpets again and then i went quickly and examined it and it's exactly what i what i thought it was um mm -hmm. how back to your back to your main question it's really critical that we distinguish between hums that is with a lower a lower case h and the world hum with a capital h there are many, many phenomena that create hums. In fact, I could probably list about 20 of them at this point. Everything from 
uh, electrical transformers to um, certain types of industrial activity to um, air conditioning and heating units up on roofs of buildings. It goes on and on. And unfortunately, many of the characteristics of those noises share characteristics with the world hum. Mm -hmm. And there, another part of the project is we have one of our resident scientists, um, Heinrich, who has on the website developed an outstanding guide for not only separating out what is in anthropogenic noise, a, a human caused noise, and what is the world hum. And he's taken it one step further and has uh, teaches people how just using your smartphone, how to actually go and track down exactly what is causing that noise. So that's been an unexpected part of the project, but I think a very useful one. So um, I've conducted- Can we find this app or, or a link to this app uh, so that people can download on your website? On the hum.info, yeah. And so yeah, sure. I, um, I, I've made attempts to record what I hear using some quite sophisticated uh, gear, some sophisticated equipment, and it's been absolute silence. And there's this other quite powerful evidence, I think, that also points away from the world hum being a typical acoustic noise. Uh, I mean, I can, I, I can go on with that, but um, for me, I think the evidence is quite convincing and therefore, okay, what, what then could it be? You may know that um, some years back, I um, did some brainstorming and mm -hmm. I identified four, what I thought were four reasonable theories as to the source of this experience. Um, and, and, and the first of which stems from, which back in 2000 and 12 was one of the very few reasonably serious scientific papers on this topic written by Dr. David Deming, who was a geoscientist at the University of Oklahoma. Mm. Now, the, the, the journal that it appeared in, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the Journal of Scientific Exploration, uh, okay, it's maybe not widely recognized as a serious journal, although there are some reasonably serious people who have published in it. Yeah. Nevertheless, I'm not interested in the source, in the publisher. I'm interested in the in the author and and their arguments and their data. And I and I found it I found it quite compelling um, all the evidence that he pulled together to suggest that powerful VLF very low frequency electromagnetic um, communication used by the world's naval powers to communicate with submarines were behind this. That the timeline was right, the geographical location was right, it all made sense. Now, unfortunately, Dr. Deming didn't have the data that I have. And mm -hmm. also, this project is the first in the internet era. There's been two other um, quite significant attempts to unlock this phenomenon, but they, again, they didn't have the data that I have. And as a result, uh, two or three of his premises were incorrect. But nevertheless, I was inspired enough to actually take his suggestion and conduct physical experiments to uh, rule in or rule out the role of uh, VLF transmissions in creating the world hum. So what makes your data, the, the data that you gathered, more uh, pointing out to the real source of the hum comparing to this uh, uh, the scientist you just mentioned? Sure. Uh, first, and I think quite crucially, we've established that there are no so-called hum hotspots. They simply don't exist. Oh, okay. I, if you take a, just as an example, if you take a population density map of North America, there's a really interesting, I just, I'll throw it out just out of interest. There's a really kind of sharp east-west population density line. It runs from about Winnipeg, Manitoba, down through the town of Laredo, Texas, 
and, and then you you overlay that map with the World Hub map, there is a striking correspondence between the two maps. In other words, where you get population density, you will get the dense, you will get hum reports. Where there's no population, you will get no hum reports. And uh, and there there are no places that I can see where the number of hum reports is greatly out of proportion to the local population or population density. So there, are, now there are some famous places such as um, uh, Taos, New Mexico, uh, Kokomo, Indiana, and uh, Windsor, the so-called Windsor hum in Canada, which by the way is most certainly not the world hum. That's the Americans who are responsible for that one. Um, okay. Their industrial activity on Zug Island. In the case of Kokomo, Indiana, it turns out it was some malfunctioning industrial equipment that was largely to blame. So we now the fact that there are no hum hotspots um, turns us away from certain types of investigations and toward others. Uh, what's all really, but and, and there's some other really interesting, really interesting results that have come out of the data so far. Um, number one, the mean and median age of hum hearers is approximately 40.5 years of age to 41 years of age, just like the general population, mm -hmm. at, least, at least amongst the, uh, in the places that I've looked. Uh, secondly, and this is quite striking, people who are fully amb ambidextrous, that is the people who can use both hands with equal facility, they yes. are dramatically overrepresented in the data. In fact, they are somewhere from five, five to eight times more likely to hear um, or to experience the hum than people who are not fully ambidextrous. Now, to me, that, that, that suggests something, maybe something neurological or, or whatnot. Males and females are almost equally distributed. We have also interesting indications that anybody with a, either a personal history or family history of attention deficit disorder and autism, but the, the one big mystery, the, 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 one, the one thing that really, really is the sharpest question of all when you're examining theories is why in the late 60s, early 70s in England, why there? And why at that time? Well, well, I can I can imagine that. Uh, I'm sorry for interrupting you here, but I can imagine uh, that uh, with this question you are uh, throwing on the table, the '60s. Uh, well, we all know that is the period uh, for a large part in the world that there was free love and there was uh, drug use and etc. People were. Uh, opening their minds and uh, creating this bridge between the left and the right brain, etc., by means of, of uh, smoking grass and etc., etc. So perhaps there's an idea that people are not so stressed in their mind and that they can hear easily what is going around them. Well, you're walking down the same road that we did uh, a few years back, and we uh, rejected. Um, certain hypotheses, um, well, for the timing, for example, in the advent of a widespread um, ca cannabis use, well, that it's, it's widespread use actually in, in uh, the United States predated that in England. But the speculation that we have center around several things. Number one, could it be that either a prescription or over-the-counter medication was introduced and became widespread in England at that time. And, and that's a reasonable thing to wonder about because you, we, we know that there are many medications, even, even simple aspirin, for example, that can be toxic, mm -hmm. to the, toxic to the auditory system. There are several antibiotics that can cause relatively instant and permanent deafness. And a lot of people don't know that. Um, several drugs in, in the penicillin and ampicillin class. So, um, that's that, that's one avenue. And the fact that the hum then became widespread, at least the reports of it in, in the 80s, early 80s in America, suggests that, well, perhaps whatever that medication or prescription was, 
was introduced to the US in around that time. Now that, that's just one avenue of speculation to explain the timing. Uh, there are others. So for example, could it be that the world hum is experienced subsequent to some other uh, environmental factor? Uh, let's, let, let's go back to, to tinnitus for a moment. Anybody who works in music studios and wears headphones all day long, or anybody who works in heavy industry with jackhammers and heavy equipment, they, their risk of developing tinnitus um, later on is increased dramatically. Those noises don't directly and immediately cause the tinnitus. They, they increase your susceptibility to it or vulnerability to it later on. Well, who knows? I mean, if the world hum, there, 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 there could be something similar that way. And it's also possible that even though we have, I think, ruled, ruled out electromagnetic um, energies as a direct source of the hum, for all we know, the hum could be some, uh, a result of some exposure to those energies uh, that appears down the road. Those are things that we are examining and trying to tease out of the data from the questions that we ask people on the on the website. In the beginning, I mentioned you also teach uh, or studied uh, uh, psychology. Now, when I'm uh, looking at YouTube, for instance, because that is the best medium to find all kinds of uh, strange sounds um, people have recorded and call it a hum. Why do you think that people uh, experience this odd vibration so differently if you say it is a, a particular frequency um it is a constant something then why do people well experience this so differently why are there so many different sounds people report well because i think that they actually are hearing different sounds as i mentioned earlier uh, i think there there are many sounds out there with typical yes. human sources that share numbers of characteristics with the world hum but there's there's, there's a there's a second factor which is that when people experience something that they don't recognize or don't understand the most common reaction reaction is anxiety or fear mm -hmm. and there's a good evolutionary purpose for that because unexplained noises can be a definite source of threat or danger. A giant dinosaur is going to eat you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, no, humans and dinosaurs, of course, didn't call uh, oh, okay. uh, But uh, well, you're I'm calling myself that old, but okay, fine, let's proceed. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, you're, but, but your point, is, your point is, is well taken then. So what is the source of the world hum? Well, uh, having ruled out the first of the four theories, which is that VLF electromagnetic radiation, uh, radiation um, uh, the, the, the three of us who are working on this team are uh, feeling pretty, pretty solid now that the hum is internally generated. In other words, it is, it is, it is a perception of sound created by some, some interaction between the brain and the human auditory system, just as tinnitus is. And, and, and there's some, and there's some uh, other uh, well-established scientific data that's out there that, that, that we've pulled together to, to, to make this claim. I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. there is a, there's a German researcher by the name of, um, of, of Frosch, uh, F R O S C H, who did some, uh, who 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 wrote a, a really interesting but not well known paper, entitled um, "The Hum and Autoacoustic Emissions May Arise from the Same Mechanism." Well, uh, for those listeners who don't know what autoacoustic emissions are, uh, they are little um, spontaneously generated noises and uh, clicks that are actually generated by the auditory system in humans. You can even detect them in newborn babies. You take these tiny microphones and you can insert them into the ear and you can actually record and hear these emissions. 
Now, I, I don't think that the hum is caused by autoacoustic emissions, but there is one really intriguing piece of evidence that may connect the two. One thing that uh, Frosch pointed out is that air travel, when you get in an, in an airplane and travel, that will short circuit and will disrupt autoacoustic auto emissions for three to four days. And interestingly, that is broadly and widely known in the hum community. The exact same thing happens to us. Whenever you take um, significant air travel, it stops the hum for about three to four days. And because, because the behavior of the hum and autoacoustic emissions are identical in that respect, there it makes sense to think that, that, they, that they might be connected. Now, um, I, over the years, have suggested oh, three, four, or five pretty basic experiments that would lead us significantly in the right direction. But nobody has taken on those experiments, either for lack of interest, uh, lack of funding, or a lack of equipment. So for example, um, I think it would be interesting just to get one of these inner ear microphones into the ears of one or more hum hearers late at night under very quiet conditions and see if there's anything that can be recorded within the inner ear. That would be very interesting. And whether we do or don't record anything would uh, point us in the right direction. And there are other experiments, by the way, which I've suggested that would, again, help point us in the right direction. So that, that's a long way of saying that we believe that the hum is generated within, that is, as some, uh, some function of the human auditory system and uh, possibly due to a, a minor an anatomical variation that exists among hum hearers or through some environmental exposure, possibly through genetics, um, that, that part is not clear yet. But you say that uh, this, this neuro function or neuron behavior uh, mm. is, might be the cause of hearing this odd noise. And that is a, a, a kind of communication between the brain and, and what is it, your inner ear and etc. So mm -hmm. when I uh, boil that down to one thing, it, it sounds that the hum is within us. But if something starts, or if something can stop, something needs to be triggered to start. So while listening to you, uh, I was thinking about the, the poles of, uh, of the Earth, uh, that uh, energy, that electrons and, and protons and, and etc. photons are going in and uh, merging with each other and, and uh, making little collisions. Could there be that there, at one point that when um, the Earth is absorbing all these particles um, and making these collisions, that there is a, a, a high pitched tone or a little pressure? What is triggering this communication between uh, particular uh, 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 certain people's brains and their inner ear and could be a cause for triggering this, hearing this sound inside you? I would say no. And the, um, let's just clarify one thing, that the, the world hum is perceived as a low frequency noise. Mm -hmm. And in, in my case, about roughly, I've matched it to roughly 56.5 hertz audio. Um, and typically the people who report, it's all, most of it's all at all less than 200 hertz audio. Uh, secondly, with regard to pole shift, a uh, fascinating topic, incidentally, one that I've read into extensively, uh, just in my background as a science teacher and also teaching biology. That, mm -hmm. well, that pole shift, of course, happens over tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of years. Um, and we always will come back to the timing. What changed significantly or dramatically in the late 60s or early 70s. And, and, then, and, and the conversation usually stops right, right about there. And uh, with regard to any other explanations, now there's some of these explanations that, that, that are ridiculous. 
However, the one about pole shift is is an interesting one, but um, it seems to me then um, if the magnetic field is connected to the hearing of the hum, then um, we should have an overwhelming amount of evidence. Well, that, that's not the case. I mean, for example, when I and the volunteers entered the VLF blocking chamber and others who have been in magnetically sealed environments, the hum hasn't been diminished at all. It's it's had no effect. So we, we, we have had people who, for example, have entered ma magnetically shielded rooms and, and chambers and it's 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 had it's had no impact at all on their perception of the hum so uh, i i'm not saying that there's um that it's impossible it's just that i need to go with what we know as opposed to what we don't know and so therefore i simply focused on things that i can test and ruled out things that i'm able to rule out just having the data that i have now what's another example uh, one 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 that I can't answer is what if the hum might be caused by ELF transmissions. ELF transmissions, like for listeners who aren't aware, the world's major naval powers, when they operate their submarines deep, deeply, even the VLF transmitters can't reach that far through ocean water. So what the the Americans and the Russians and the Chinese and the Indians and uh, uh, what they will do is they'll set an ELF gong. They, they'll send out a single blast of now ELF will transit the Earth. ELF will go right through the Earth, reach the submarine, and they'll receive the signal and go oh, and so they'll come up to antenna depth, and then receive a VLF message, and VLF radio can can break through ocean water down to about, I forget what it is, 30, 40, 50 meters. Could it be that the hum is caused by some sort of ELF transmission? It's actually possible. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know for sure. And it's in, in, interestingly, it's impossible for me to test that because I, 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 you, you, you can't build a chamber that blocks ELF radio. Um, so not even, I, not even a silent room. There, there are rooms that uh, well cast out every or do not even absorb and let not through any sound at all. Allow me to explain. Yes. Now, um, not to be sarcastic here, but some of your listeners may be familiar with the phrase that we have in English: the tinfoil hat. Now, yes. what? Now, what's 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 really really ironic about the tinfoil hat is that they actually do what they claim to do. Serious, I always had this idea that uh, it was uh, creating a kind of Faraday uh, cage and that yeah. your brain is going to fry up or something. It, it's, it, it's, it's crucial that I give a very, a very brief science lesson here and, it, and okay. I will be brief, but it's, it's, quite, it's quite crucial that I, that I do. Okay. There's a reason why we don't put tinfoil in the microwave oven. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There, there's, there is, there's a reason why. And the reason why is because microwaves can be blocked and deflected by a thin layer of metal foil. Yes. Now, for if, if anybody out there actually thinks that secret government forces or whatever are trying to beam microwave uh, radiation into their heads, a layer of foil will actually work. And incidentally, for anyone who thinks that I have no um, uh, deep interest in this, there have been some demented experiments conducted by um, serious scientists. The, the most fascinating one of which is by Dr. Alan Frey, the American mm -hmm. neuroscientist. He actually beamed microwave radiation directly into people's skulls, into what? people's. Oh yeah, and, uh, but what's fascinating about it is the people heard clicks and buzzing noises. And I can imagine that. No, <laughs> it's microwave. It gets better. It actually gets. It actually gets, gets better than this. He then had. Oh. A, he then had a demented idea. Let's actually take a microphone and modulate the microphones to see if we can transmit speech directly into people's heads. 
Ooh, skull to skull devices. Yes, and, and by the way, there is one piece of reasonably serious evidence that there was some minor success in attempting this. But that's a bit of a distraction from my science lesson, which is this. The reason why the military uses VLF radio is because it can actually um, reach down into, into the ocean, a certain mm -hmm. depth. And so therefore, when I built my VLF blocking box, I had to find a material that at a fairly thin thickness would also block uh, VLF radio. And I finally found the right material and I built a special box to, uh, to, uh, to do that. Now, back to ELF. And by the way, what I essentially did was build, build a Faraday cage. But, the, but the, the people who, for example, have tried to build um, we have a little bit of noise here, my apologies. Uh, the, some of the people who did build their own Faraday cage didn't understand this physics. Well, uh, because sure, you can block basic radio transmission waves, AM, FM. You can also block uh, microwaves and that sort of thing. But VLF radio can even go through like that thickness of pure aluminum. ELF radio, it can slice through the earth. Like there is no way you can block ELF radio. So the only way to test that is to change the conditions of the test. And that is, uh, look at the historical data, and which is interesting, by the way, um, when, when you look at the first huge ground-based ELF transmitters, or to um, get the military to turn them off. And I don't think that's going to be happening any time soon. So I'm not saying that I'm even seriously considering that, but it's one that I can't test and one that I can't rule out. So listening to to this uh, and 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 your uh, well ideas or or the the well should I say data gathered or mm -hmm. it is easy for people to well step this line um, step over this line into conspiracy thinking oh my god the uh, chinese government is uh, aiming at us with all kinds of frequencies or the, the american uh, government is or the european or whatever so do you think that is that the reason, because people have no clue, no clear clue, no real idea for what this world hum really is, and that they are eas so easily, well, stepping over this line into conspiracy. Fear for the unknown? Uh, there are some people, either by nature or by experience or training, they would prefer and would automatically reach for the supernatural, for yes. the the, 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 the conspiratorial, it's more interesting. It's more exciting. Oh, it and gives you it, a thrill, doesn't it? <laughs> it also gives them a sense of power and control in a way, is to pigeonhole or to categorize these things that way. And also, um, it really enables the pseudoscientists to uh, do what they do, which is often quite, often quite counterproductive and often quite damaging. In other words, when we encounter something that's unexplained, uh, this is a very ripe ground for the charlatans and the pseudoscientists um, to step in using, their, using the type of language that they use and the type of imagery that they use, um, which also is easier for everyday people to understand. Part of the problem is, again, that science is hard work. And it takes a considerable background to do any meaningful science. I mean, not the kind of stuff we do in junior high school or high school, but um, any sort of science that moves toward the edge of what human beings know is extremely complicated. And it's simply beyond the realm, it's beyond the grasp of most people. If you take a look at the science reporting out there, whether we're talking about dark matter or whether we're talking about um, cosmology or whatever it is, um, there's no way that we can present these topics to the public in their full form. It's simply, um, it, it requires too much background. But the pseudoscientists can present things in a way that people can understand and also some of the fanatics. So for example, 
with these back to these so-called sky trumpets. Most of them talk about the about the the trumpet is sounding the return of the Messiah or the the coming apocalypse and all this kind of thing. And for me, I have a very open mind, but I also have a very um, critical mind. And so if someone says to me that um, the hub is caused by aliens, for example, I've, I've heard this. Name. I say, okay, fine, sure. Okay, let, let's discuss that. What is the, what's your evidence for that? And then the subject gets changed. And then they, and they, and they bounce over here to mention this. I say, okay, well, that's very interesting. Let's talk about that for a minute. What's your evidence for that? And then the subject gets changed again. And so we, we, and we dance around in this frustrating circle where we never really address whatever facts they think they have. And that means that I'm not very popular in those circles because um, I'm, I'm just simply asking hard questions and um, I don't mind being asked hard questions myself. And if I don't know the answer to something, I'll say so. As I scroll through uh, the website of www.thehum.info, uh, the first image that I saw was the world map with these locations people have reported to have heard this eerie, almost alien sounding sound. This map showing or, or is showing that the UK and, and, and Canada, but UK mostly and a very large part of the of Europe is almost well finger quote under the influence of this hum. What makes the UK so uh, beloved for uh, and 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 a large part of Europe beloved by the hum in compared to Asia, for instance? Uh, two very simple reasons. Number one, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's a question of population density. The last time I checked, the population density of England was maybe about 240 people per square kilometer, um, something along those lines. Um, now, with regard to Asia and Russia and whatnot, it's a simple language barrier. Um, ha the HUM survey has been translated into several uh, languages. Uh, uh, apparently, I forgot to include the the link to the Chinese uh, version, the one in Mandarin. Well, actually, in the written language, uh, Cantonese Mandarin doesn't matter. But I, I, uh, I apparently forgot to include the link on the latest version of the HUM map. But even so, there is a a language barrier. I, I mean, I'm I, I I would be able to do an interview in Russian in very basic Russian and very. Mm -hmm halting, limited Russian, and even poor French. But I think that would be a scandal if I were to have an interview in those languages. And therefore, um, the only big exposure that we've had in Asia has been through the national Japanese broadcaster uh, NHK, who came up here with a documentary crew and then did their uh, work in Japanese. So, it's simply it's simply a matter of um, language barrier and uh, and population density in i mean comparing england to other places so now we have um, explored the possibility of the real source or of what this world hum might uh, uh, be you say the, it is most likely that it is a combination or um, communication between the brain or the neuron activities and the inner ear that the hum is really being played to say so inside of us but uh, i also said that millions of people or thousands of people uh, do hear this differently so what how does the world hum really sounds like? A number of descriptions have been used, but there is one classic description which is very fitting and fits what I experience. It sounds like a vehicle, you know, a car or truck idling outside one's home or maybe just halfway down the block. Um, 
when I say idling, I think the British use the phrase uh, ticking over. That is a vehicle that's just sitting at the engine running. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it very much has this quality, but it has other aspects to it. For example, if you take a piece of electrical equipment that's malfunctioning and you, and you get that low hum, uh, for some people it has that quality. For some people, uh, they would use the word, it has a droning um, noise or a very low grinding or growling type noise. Uh, 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 the, the word hum is, um, it works. Uh, in, in German, I believe the phrase they use is the Brumton or something like that. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. No, I haven't heard it here yet, uh, but uh, most people are staying away uh, from these, uh, at least the part that I am living in, in Germany. Um, but no, I, I, I think I haven't heard that term yet. Yeah. And again, I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly, but... Uh, oh, well. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 uh, I, I try to speak English and every now and then, well, mostly, <laughs> I pronounce every word incorrectly, so okay. Oh, no, it's I'm, no I'm problem. Having no trouble with that. But the, yeah, so that, that idling engine um, description is, is a classic one. And so we use a series of questions on the survey to filter out people who of course are experiencing or hearing something but it's not what i'm studying and so there are some interesting characteristics of the sound that rule out um well let me just jump into those one interesting aspect of the sound is if you're hearing the hum if you make a sudden sort of loud exhaling noise like or if someone shakes their head really quickly, that stops mm -hmm. the hum for like three to four hundred milliseconds, like almost half a second, and then it, and then it returns. Uh, many or most low frequency sounds don't don't behave this way. More moreover, uh, again, the fact that the sound is louder indoors than out, and louder at night than during the day, uh, lets us lets us eliminate anywhere from 50 to 60 percent of the people who report. Now, I'm, I'm not saying I don't believe these people. I'm saying whatever you're hearing is not what I'm studying. That's a, an important distinction. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, I also get people to rate the amount of effort they've put into tracking down the noise. And if someone indicates that they've put very little effort into tracking down the noise, then that report gets rejected, at least for going onto my map because just with a moderate amount of effort, you can track down environmental sounds. I'll give you one quick example. In uh, Germany and in Europe, you have a 50 Hertz electric grid. Now, it turns out that the electric hum that you'll hear in transformers and whatnot in Europe are at double that frequency that is at, at 100 Hertz. In North America, we have a 60 Hertz grid and transformer and other noises tend to arrive at double that, that is 120 hertz audio. Now, when I get a person to actually match the frequency, I'll get them to go to a, a website like um, I mean, onlinetonegenerator.com and I'll get them to use the slider to adjust the frequency to match what they hear. If anyone out of Europe reports a 100 hertz noise, mm -hmm. sorry, but that, that's not what I'm studying. Almost certainly you're hearing some aspect of the electric grid. So this is another example of how I can filter out and separate human caused noises from the worldwide generic phenomena that I'm studying. To, to, to uh, explain this in words, uh, this 100 hertz or mm -hmm. megahertz, uh, is that a high pitch tone or a low pitch tone? No, well, um, Actually, I've, I've never done this before, but what I'll do is I'll just reach over to um, uh, an online uh, tone generator just as, as we speak. Mm -hmm. And um, allow me to see. So here we have um, a tone coming of 440 hertz. Now, um, hertz. Uh, is simply the number of vibrations per second. 
and that's what, as you as you mentioned earlier, that's what sound is, our vibrations in the air. Though, so that's four hundred forty hertz. So if we drop that down now to about two hundred hertz, um, almost all of the hum reports we get will will match below that frequency. Now, unfortunately, my computer um, speaker system may not play well the the frequency that um, I've matched it to, which is about 56.5. So I'll just play it, although it's probably going to be inaudible to you. I don't know whether you heard that or not. Probably not. But yes, I heard oh, you, perfectly. Yeah, oh, you did. Great. Okay, so sound energy and electromagnetic energy, radio energy, as an example, are two completely, and I mean dramatically, different things and what's really unfortunate however is we use the same unit for measuring their frequency so for example yeah they see a lot of people just don't don't know this like i mean if you take a look at um the fm radio dial um it starts over at the left i think at about i think it's at about 88 megahertz now that's 88 million vibrations per second, but that's radio energy. Travels at the speed of light, travels through space, um, et cetera, et cetera. Well, when, we, when we're talking about sound, we are talking about a series of vibrations that, trans, that move through the air, that move through a medium. And human beings can detect sound frequencies somewhere about 20 hertz that's somewhere at about 20 vibrations per second you get a very very low rumble it almost you can almost feel it more than you can hear it the highest like uh, people my age can maybe hear 16,000 16,000 like a 16 kilohertz 16,000 hertz young children can hear up to 19,000 20,000 hertz and that's it. And above that, the dogs can, and the rodents and other animals can, can hear those. So when we talk about hertz or megahertz, let's understand something. Normal acoustic sounds, audio frequencies, and radio frequencies, which are completely different, both use the same unit for measurement. And that's what's really confused this conversation quite a bit. So that, 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 that is the distinction there. Now I have a question. This is this happened uh, in the in the in the time that I was living in Africa. And I have lived there for about three years, and the first eight months uh, that I lived there, my home was uh, a small mountain in Zanin, Limpopo. And one night um, there was this immensely horrifying, eerie, never heard before sound. This was a sound that, well, it felt like being a huge train approaching yes. me. But yes. the strange thing was that the sound never, it was boom, there, and boom, it was, uh, it was gone. And uh, it never changed uh, the loudness or the distances, or, but it was like a huge train. And uh, that I was that scared that uh, well in my recolle uh, recollection is that in my memory that I uh, put uh, my kids uh, the jackets on and etc and I was ready to flee so because I didn't know what it was. Um, but do you think that something like that can be uh, can be the world hum? Because there's another thing below the mountain there was a mine and. Uh, Thomas, that was a man from the township uh, below at the foot of the mountain, said that the sound was probably coming from the mine. But at night there was no, uh, there were no people working in that mine. Yeah. So do you think that I heard the world hum or was that something from, let's say, the city Pretoria? It was not the hum, uh, almost, okay. certainly, almost, almost certainly based on what you said. One thing is that the hum is not a not a single event. It's something that is long lasting. It, it's something that people experience regularly over time. It's not a one off, as we say. And <clears throat> the nature of what you said 
makes it almost certainly sound like you were uh, you were hearing something else. Now, I could. Uh, how long did the sound last? May I ask? Ooh, I have to dig deep into my memory, but uh, at least five till seven minutes, perhaps ten, but I'm not quite sure. And not that long, and it only happened once. There's there's another um, clue that you've given me that you were almost certainly not hearing the hum, and that is by our best estimates, only, well, a maximum perhaps of 4%. Four, 4 of the world's population can hear this, assuming they're in the right conditions and assuming they know what they're listening for. Uh, one of the reasons why I've needed to normalize this phenomenon is that there are many people who have been terrified of the consequences of coming forward and saying they can hear it. And the reason why is because very often they are the only person in the house who can hear it. And they don't want people to think that they're crazy or that they're hallucinating. So if you just ran, had a random conversation with someone else there who heard it, no, it's almost certainly not the world hum. It's an acoustic source. It is interesting, by the way, to speculate on the source of that noise. And I would start with industrial activity. Um, and we could, for example, you know, if it lasted five to seven minutes, it's probably not a seismic event or maybe some massive underground shifting or a wall uh, rock collapse or anything like that. Uh, it 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 could well be that you've got some industrial activity that sound has been funneled down a valley or down a ravine and all those types of things. If I were there and if I had three or four assistants in different locations, we could use triangulation methods and pinpoint exactly what that was. But unfortunately, uh, history is not likely to offer us that experiment again. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, you're saying uh, uh, people are not uh, coming forward uh, that easily to speak about uh, what they have heard because they have this idea that people think that they are crazy. Well, my husband is used to crazy stuff that I'm talking about, so <laughs> I'm very comfortable with that one. Here's another thing. Um, I was already living in Germany for, I think it was already two or three years, and I was walking my dog. Um, um suddenly I heard a sound and I was aiming my my, my head, uh, including my ears, of course, uh, like a dog is trying to figure out where a, a particular sound is coming from. And this sound was uh, low, soft, and it sounded like this Indian uh, uh, mantra, I believe it is, that om, that kind of sound. Um, this time I was the only one that heard it, uh, even my husband was walking uh, behind me with, with another dog, but so could that be uh, um, uh, an, well, a world hum? Uh, it, it's not enough evidence to say. It, it, what's, what's interesting is there are some uh, Tibetan chants yes. that um, using um, uh, Om, which, by the way, in that religion is known as the seed syllable. In uh, Tibetan Buddhism, um, the the full mantra is uh, Om Mani Padme Hong, um, which means that the the jewel is in the lotus. Is the translation within that within that religion? Now, all I can say is that it's that it's that it's possible, but again, not enough data. I mean, uh, no offense. But if just that were reported to my website, I'm sorry, but that would not be sufficient to. Now, uh, you, of course, did, you, you, of course, did hear something. I don't have enough information to make it an educated guess as to what. My story would be declined from your website. Oh, my God. <laughs> you'll have, Why you'll don't have I have stagger, this you'll have to stagger story. forward with that. <laughs> I, <laughs> Again? <laughs> we'll have to stagger forward, I'm afraid. Uh, with that. My, 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 my website, for better or worse, has become something of a collecting point for unexplained auditory phenomena. As it turns out, I'm only researching one of those. But I do, I, I, I've heard many reports like yours, by the way, um, of the one you just described. Oh, you're certainly not the only person to report that. It's just that I don't have... I'm so glad I'm not the owner. 
many, there are many, many people who have reported something very similar, but I have no even speculation at this point as to what that might be because I don't have enough information. Dr. McPherson, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk with you. And I see that the hour is, uh, we have extended the hour. But before we close out, can you tell us where we can find more information about your books? Because you have read, uh, written books about this, your research, and for how people to contact you when you have when they have questions for you. Um, sure. Well, I think the place to start, of course, would be at the hum.info. From there, you can link to my blog, my research blog. And there are also a few videos uh, on YouTube under my uh, channel. With regard to the, the publishing of books and articles, uh, I'm afraid that that's in my academic sphere, in mathematics education, which will be of limited interest to uh, perhaps to the wider public. But there, if you just certainly uh, Google my name, uh, under just Dr. Glenn McPherson, you can locate all of those um, resources that I mentioned. Thank you all for tuning in this week on The Next Truth with Science and Myth Meet. Make sure to visit our website, www.nexttruth.com. That is nexttruth, all in one word, dot com. And let us know what you think about our podcast. While you're at it, if you find value in this show, we would appreciate a rating on our website in the section The Next Truth Podcasts. Or if you would simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us too. I am Maria Anna van Driel with The Next Truth. Be sure to tune in next week for our next episode.